Good morning, everyone. This is James Ross with uh, No Patterns, the Random Conversation Podcast, and I am here with a lifelong friend of mine, <laughs> That's true. Sergeant First Class Retired U.S. Army Airborne Brandon Pache. Not only does he have many uh, accolades in the U.S. military and um, many things he's did in his life with that service, but he also is a current Huntington's uh, survivor and winner. He's also uh, a very uh, strong advocate for Dominion Martial Arts over in uh, Oswego and a supporter of Vets uh, vets and Athletes, yeah, sure. is that? V-E-T-S-A-U.com. I will have all the links in the bio. Brandon, what brings inspiration to your daily life? Uh, Tell us a little bit about Daily What's life on, for me is is essentially still being in the war mindset, warrior mindset, and living war day to day in my brain. I got every day I have to do some things to pump myself up mentally and physically to fight Huntington's disease. Huntington's disease was something I was born with that my dad had and his dad had, so it's genetic and hereditary, and it's a flip of a coin, a fifty percent chance. And really, it's just being super drunk. That's the most crazy symptom, is just being really, really, really drunk, mentally and physically. But So, quick pun, what happens when you drink then? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Are you, like, super yeah, drunk to the, yeah, like the eighth power? <laughs> yeah, it gets really bad. But I don't really do, I don't really drink too much anymore. But, yeah, definitely, yeah, I do. <laughs> I get super, super drunk real quick and it gets nasty it so gets like one actually. shot of you don't even need tequila so like one yeah. shot of a corona light yeah, and boom I'll, you're out of there right yeah i'll be out dancing on the beach with my hair on fire and they get probably <laughs> we're, we're not going to show that picture on uh on our podcast or on our live streams yeah what that's not. what i would do definitely <laughs> that would just be wild Whoa. as hell so now i gotta be super reserved and very self-controlled because i'm not at all i'm a wild guy who likes to just run around with his hair on fire but I can't do that with Huntington's or PTSD at all. I gotta stay real calm and real collected. And it's actually a pretty good life, honestly. It's, I, I win more than I lose now with that mindset. So can you relate to, oh, what, what was the famous player? Uh, Lou Gehrig. Remember uh, Lou Gehrig, he was, he was diagnosed um, with ALS. Yes, sir. Right? And he goes in the Yankee Stadium. I believe it's one of the last days of his career. Mm. And he says, I'm the luckiest man alive. Even though he, he knew it was it, this was a disease he was not going to defeat. Uh, I'll be honest, yes, I actually can. Because it made me, no, knowing I'm finally fighting, really fighting for my own life. I, I fight hard. It's hard to hear this or weird to say this. But I fight harder now for myself against Huntington's that I did in the military overseas. That is a bold and, statement. Yeah, wow. it's weird because honestly, in the military, I was pretty, I was very mediocre. And uh, You were mediocre? Oh, yes, sir. Oh, very, wow. very mediocre because I still had that super stupid teenage mindset and nothing was very serious. I wasn't very serious about things, even in combat against, I mean, I, I killed people, but I was still like kind of a joke to me, not real. Honestly, because I still had that stupid teenage mindset. But now, facing Huntington's every day, it's like, and I actually take it seriously, and I take myself seriously. So I have to get in a combat mode, but not too much of combat mode, but combat mode in order to fight it. So I'm very tactful, tactical in what I do. Tactful and tactical in the ways I fight in my mind every day, physically and mentally. And then I'm fine for the rest of the day. So you yeah, took sure. something, and, and this almost goes like to a scripture reference, like Genesis fifty twenty is something that's always inspired me. Where it's like, you know, the the devil made something bad, but you completely took that and turned it around, like yes. stories and Definitely. testimonies. So that almost gave you a new outlook or a better outlook on life, even though oh, it's kind of a, a debilitating disease in a way. But I'm sitting there, and it's just like you're just a normal dude. You're just like jumping around a little bit. Yeah. It's not like. You're defeated here. No, no. Uh, I was defeated for a long time. I weighed 270 pounds. I gave up on life for a good decade. And uh, yeah, I was all messed up. I quit caring really about everything. And I just wanted it to take me away. I really just ate myself to death. I was trying to eat myself to death. And 
finally something kicked in one more actually uh, I went to the VA and I found out I had skin cancer on my face and I realized uh, yeah I'm not going to die from skin cancer I'm going to die from Huntington's so I got to get my shit together and I flipped around what I ate and started working out really hard and started going to the gym and that's when I discovered Dominion Mixed Martial Arts and that has been my love affair for like a decade now. And you've been fighting like our whole lives. You've been... Yeah, the, here and there. Yeah. Definitely. I mean, Definitely. I remember you love just kicking the hell out of us in the backyard <laughs> and dropping us on the concrete and, you know, <laughs> just laughing at us that we couldn't even do anything towards you at all. Like... Yeah. Well, I mean, you're laughing now. It wasn't that's, funny at the time. I mean, ask anybody who knew Brandon Pache back in the day. And, still happens at the gym. That's funny. <laughs> <laughs> I got the old old man shank now. Wow. Yeah, that's funny. That's so, hilarious. So, so tell me, we'll, and we'll get into the Dominions. We'll get into your time over yeah, in, in Afghanistan, Iraq. Tell me more about Huntington's. So why is this a debilitating disease? Has anybody beat it? Is there a cure? There tell me about it. There are absolutely zero cures. At all. However, there's tons of scientific progress in the a lot of communities, and there's lots of support groups on the internet, Facebook, and all that stuff. Uh, the only thing I like about Facebook is the support groups of those things. Uh, man, without that, honestly, yeah, it's been really helpful for a lot of people. So, getting to know people who have stories exactly like yours, who really know deep down because Huntington's makes everybody in that family mentally unhealthy, super unhealthy. We don't realize it, but yeah, everybody who grows up in a Huntington family is so mentally unhealthy. It's just unfit because it's crazy. It's a crazy disease and it just goes up and down, gets worse and up and down, and worse and worse and worse, and it takes over and then you die. It's insane. So it, it's kind of like a rolling PTSD for almost everybody that has to deal with it. Yes. So it's like exactly. having an alcoholic father. Yes, sir. Even yes. though he's not an alcoholic, yes, he's sir. just like mentally, th there's just something there that's not. Yes. It's it's brain. It's literally brain damage. That's what it does. It causes huge holes in my brain, like brain damage from CTE or from getting blown up overseas or from getting punched in the head as a boxer or whatever or football players. Huge, like uh, I call them my Swiss cheese holes. My Swiss cheese holes get bigger and bigger and bigger until I die. So do you? So do you physically have a brain like an old professional wrestler or an old football exactly. center? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. However, I do a ton of ridiculous brain exercises and body exercises, and I've gone through three different neuroplastic breakthroughs. Uh, neuroplasticity is a I guess it's a science now. I think it's a, it should definitely be. Yeah, I've heard a lot about it. Yeah. It's an amazing thing because uh, two, I'm not sure exactly when the year was, maybe four years ago, my brain fog was really bad and my mind wasn't working at all. And I had to sleep like 10 or 12 hours a day and I just didn't, well, not much was really there and my brain was totally going away. And then I woke up one morning a couple of Novembers ago and I was like, whoa. What's going on? What new, what new medicine? Because I'm constantly very aware of what medicines I take, what foods I yeah, eat, yeah. what I do, what I don't do to make me feel crappy or to make me feel good. So I'm constantly doing the science thing back and forth going, oh, oh that's uh, right in the middle. That's good. So I tr try all these different treatments and finally something kicked in. And I had a neuroplastic breakthrough and my brain fog was gone. And I didn't say anything for weeks, for two weeks. I was like, what? This has to be a fluke. I'm going to wake up tomorrow. And I'll be back to normal. Nope. Nope. Two years now. Every November. Two years now. Every so November. So is it something that neurologically like sobered you up? Yes, because I've been doing all these brain games, like learning things, uh, new languages. I learn new languages on my apps. And I also speak. Uh, I do everything with my core, with my abs. Uh, I speak with my abs. I drink water with my abs. I do martial arts with my abs. I drive with my abs. I do every single thing with my core. So I do it nice and slow, and I'm very thoughtful of what I'm doing. So, so you're driving and doing calisthenics. Yes, yes. <laughs> like yeah, you're doing yeah, Bruce Lee stuff, and ah, people are looking at you like, who's this yeah. weird dude just making all those moves, yeah, right? Exactly. You're like, dude, I'll kill you. <laughs> I'll look at you and kill you. <laughs> yeah. But that's not me, though. Uh, I, yeah. If, if not somebody anymore. had a problem with me, yeah. You should have seen him when he was 14. Yeah, yeah that's true. Now I You were 100 super, pounds heavier than everybody and just like, <laughs> hey, put this app on top of your head. Let's see if I can either take him with my dagger or my toe. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody was like terrified of your nunchucks. Uh, oh, man, those were the days. My bow and arrow. 
Oh, you had that yellow Bruce Lee book, and you were always like terrorized. Hey, Jimmy, come over here. Let me try this move on you. I'm like, oh, uh, yeah, sure. Boom. And it uh, you know. uh, yeah. that was like right before MMA got big. You know? Yes, sir. That was Godfather of MMA. Bruce Lee. Wow. That's wow. so hilarious. I can't believe that. So, so looking, looking <laughs> yeah. back in hindsight, I, I look at the, 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 uh, the advances we had, neuroplasticity and, yes, and PTSD and, and, um, and, and, and childhood uh, trauma that I have and you have, obviously. And I look at this world. If my mother would have been, you know, she died 10 years ago, but if my mother would have been alive during this time and had this, the key word is support group. Because you don't have a support group, you're on your own, you're toast. I, I don't care yes, if you're like the most intelligent human being. It's just, it's hard. Yes, sir. You know, if she would have had the the understandings and they would, she would have had the empathy and the education that we have nowadays in these certain groups, not as a whole, she could have fought these mental diseases yes, she had. And so oh, wow. you look at your grandfather, you look at your your father. Did they have these advances? Did they have these technology? Like a, a little bit. They had some, some, some kind of support groups, but they didn't really have uh, not the technology or the, like the know-how. We we have the know-how. The science is there. The science can see what's going on. But my grandpa, we had no idea where that uh, gene was. Turns out it's on your fourth chromosome. But back in the 80s and 90s, zero idea where Huntington's came from. But as more and more science progresses, we really figure out where it came from and how we can fight it because of it. So unfortunately, they're well, just hosed. And, and, and it's amazing because I have one of my best friends I grew up with. Um, he He's HIV positive. Oh, dude. I'll that's never hard. say his name. I'll never say this person's name. Um, but you would never know in a million years really? that he was. But now oh, in yeah. the 80s, he would have been in a coffin in six months. Yeah. So it's like good. polio. Now we got the vaccine. Boom. It's gone. Yes, we solved it. Science is good. You know, uh, great. And so it's like, do you think Huntington's is going to be the polio in 100 years, hopefully? Uh, pretty much most bad rare diseases and stuff will be cured in the, probably the next couple of years. Honestly. Honestly, with all the couple research, years, yeah, with the, all the research going on, yes, uh, there are some really awesome wow, things that will statement. lower the Huntington's uh, protein. Uh, so all these extra proteins get logged up in my, my brain, and uh, everyone has Huntington proteins in their brain, but mine create a whole bunch more, like a whole excess, and it clogs up the waterways, and then everything gets stagnant, and when stagnant things are there, and they don't have or water or oxygen they die so that's what it does to my brain but there are ways now that they can lower that proteins down to the normal levels and they're doing research now i was actually in a drug study that was supposed to do that but they did an mri in my brain and they said i don't have enough brain left brain matter left to do the five-year study so that was kind of a big kick of the nuts but it was all right though because i'm still doing my thing so they gotta catch it early is it easy to catch early uh, it depends on your genealogy, but yeah, it is now. Now it, it definitely is, is. But pe most people now don't really want to. A lot of people, it's a secret. It's very hush hush. Nobody wants to know about it. So, because nobody wants to tell the truth about that thing, because it's a horrible thing to think about or to know that you might have that, and it might make you do some crazy things, make you a wacky person or a little wackier. So you just pretend like you don't have it until you really do, and it messes you up. Interesting. Or for me, I got therapy for PTSD for years, but I didn't get it for Huntington's until a little bit ago because I figured I was dumb, and I was like, oh, I'm good. I don't need therapy for Huntington's. I just did it for PTSD. But really, I should have definitely been doing it for Huntington's also the entire time. Now I do. I will never not do mental therapy until I die. I will do mental therapy. Is there an organization out there that you support that we could send? You know, hopefully, we're hoping that a couple thousand people will see this over the next year. That people can support, learn more about Google, YouTube, podcasts, about this Huntington's thing. Uh, if there's someone out there that has it or there's someone that just wants to is just curious on how to help Huntington's Disease Society of America okay. is okay. okay however it is it's a non-profit however it's a I'm putting that in air quotes non-profit yeah, yeah. they, they uh, really only care about the pro they, yeah. yeah they only care about being corporate 
Yeah. They don't really care about other people too much. But it's still a great place in there. They do some good things, though. I just don't really like the corporate aspect of it. Yeah. But they do really good things for people. They'll pay for them to get tested and go through, do some, do some counseling. Okay. So it's a good organization. And if you want to learn more about it and figure that things and actually take the test, blood test, or figure out uh, life planning, that's what we did. We planned for our lives out. And we were truthful because we knew that my wife, had Jessica, and I knew that I was uh, at risk for it. So back in 2006, we paid for it out of our own pocket. And we were very hush-hush about it because we didn't want anybody to know about it. So we were hush-hush, but we found out in 2006 that I had Huntington's. And it was a bad version of Huntington's, like pretty pretty hard, pretty high. 47 is the level that I have. Uh, 49 or higher is considered juvenile Huntington's, and that's the worst thing. I'm so lucky that I don't have juvenile Huntington's or it doesn't run in my family. Because I couldn't even imagine being a child and having Huntington's. Oh, and really, really bad Huntington's. Oh, man, that's just makes you cry, makes your soul shake. But I don't have that, and I'm a good fighter, and I'm super, uh, super good at fighting and don't want to die. Pretty stubborn. Well, speaking of that, some of the some of the ways you're channeling this frustration and, and, and this anxiety of having this disease is through mixed martial arts yes sir. and so growing up i i i just what what was that what's the tag if you could tag what you learned growing up uh, what what was the i learned actually back in the day jeep kunda oh bruce lee went, exactly yeah bruce so lee. so the wooden yeah. doll with the pegs right yes yeah sir. i remember uh, that. Yeah. that and stick fighting was part of that program too and the, the instructor of the sifu actually i took it for six months at the one of the one of the places downtown and it was free actually it was free for Jim Brown and I had to go there and take classes don't know how or why but it was free and I fell in love with that lifestyle couldn't get enough of that stuff just the discipline and learning to maneuver my body and to, to push myself and the grappling I love the grappling and uh, kicking people in the head was fun <laughs> and just, just it wasn't work, fun for the guys who <laughs> kicked in the head <laughs> just work, working out made me feel really positive instead of crappy so i realized hey if i work out i can feel better and when i'm done with any martial arts class or any harder exercise i just don't feel bad feelings towards anyone across the world i know everyone is like that if you work out really hard you don't feel any crap you feel good there's no mentor of mine that says when in doubt go work out yes, sir. <laughs> and that's whenever i'm like super frustrated i i need to go hit some weights yeah, you, you know go. just yes, even if it go for know. a jog do so, something yeah. physical anything but a cheeseburger like no yeah, cheeseburgers dude. no drugs just go out there that, drink some water oh, pop some creatine yes, and go hit the hit the, <laughs> hit yeah. the bench <laughs> my drug has been, always been food for real yeah. I'm a legit food addict, especially donuts. Oh my God, oh. donuts and cake. Oh yeah, dude. I was yeah. 270 when I first started at Dominion, like I said, 270. 270. Now I'm 180. What year was 270? Uh, 10 years ago. 10 years ago. Yeah, yeah. you were always yeah. husky as a kid. Yeah, I was yeah, always yeah. chubby. Uh, chubby. Yeah. Even in the army, I was chubby. Didn't realize it. Always a fact of, always been a food addict. For a legit food addict. 270. Wow. Yeah, not muscular 270. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, there's like, yeah, yeah, there's like Brock Lesnar. Yeah. Well, he's probably yeah. like three some, but <laughs> yeah. That guy. yeah, you can tell. Now, wow. now I actually look like an MMA fighter. And yeah, because of I mean, you're skinny though. Like, you kind of look <laughs> like a biker, not not like a Harley guy, but like someone that yeah. would you know, jump in a speedo and Definitely. hit Lakeshore Drive. You know, like I've done a couple of triathlons actually, and no ma kidding. marathons actually. I love running. Love. Well, I will call it jogging. Jogging. Well, I don't while know. you're suffering through your physical ailments, you're oh, pursuing yeah. that. Yes, sir. Yeah, it helps me the training for it, and then uh, just to get through something like that. Jogging for five hours is pretty sweet. It's jogging like, for five hours is yeah. pretty sweet. Wow, <laughs> I couldn't think of anything less sweet than jogging for five hours. But then, yeah, it, hey, it's your boat, though, right? Yeah, I love. Always love pushing my boundaries. I always love it. So, so tell me about Dominion. What's so special about Dominion Oswego? What's uh, going on over there? It's, it's mixed martial arts, but the, what's the most important thing that everyone gets there all the way from the three-year-old children to a 65-year-old man is there. Shout out to Gary. Uh, 
it's all about the mentorship. Everyone is trying to grow up to be a better person, a better human being for themselves, for them, their family, and for uh, the world so they can be a good adult. Because we grew up as really bad adults, or really bad teens who turned out to be teenage-minded adults. It's funny you say that because, like, you were not, you were like the, like, I, I, I would not describe you as a bad teen. I mean, you weren't oh. in jail, you weren't in drugs like the rest of us were. Or a little, I would have been, for sure, yeah. if we didn't leave. Yeah. Kingpin, maybe, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because everybody knew a little Jimmy Ross was going to jail. I mean, there was no question. Yes, sir. My, and, but, yeah. I mean, I'm 40 years old. I'm living here. So it's like, you know, yes, you're sir. living too. You're so. a survivor and a warrior because of that. life is difficult and you're still here. So what yeah. kind of techniques in the mixed martial arts? So there's so mar martial arts and you got mixed martial arts. So there's like 90 different fighting styles. What is the main thing going on there? Is there uh, jiu-jitsu? It's there... mostly Thai boxing. There's two, two things. Muay Thai okay. boxing, which is they do that in Thailand. And their throws in it. It's awesome. Their elbows, their knees, punches and kicks. And then jiu-jitsu, which is awesome because you're choking people up. And that's up. grappling you're on grappling, the ground, right? Yes, you're yeah. grappling and choking people up. Yeah. And uh, making them submit or, or submitting yourself and being humble to be submitted by another person is sweet. I was I riding it. with a guy for three days last week. We're, we're doing some uh, work. And the guy was just telling me about jujitsu, and right. he wouldn't oh. shut up about. I was like, "Well, but I was thinking about putting Gideon in boxing and get him in wrestling and getting him some jit kune do because I love how Bruce Lee took that old ancient fighting and turned translated into that people's vernacular. He was just like a regular dude, but he was bad, right? Yes. And he was like, "No, man, you 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 got to do the Royce Gracie G, the, whatever I, that's called, I, jit, whatever jujitsu. Yeah, jujitsu. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Especially yeah. when you're in a fight, because yeah. it always always comes down to the ground. Nine, All that nine, Hollywood." Nine, Stuff. Nine of the time, yeah, it definitely comes to the ground. However, knowing how to move your head and to get a good punch in somebody is also really good. So boxing, yeah, boxing and yeah. Kundo or jiu-jitsu. If, if I were president, I would make Brazilian jiu-jitsu or whatever we call it over here because you'll get sued if you if you had the B. So we'll call it just jiu-jitsu. Yeah, oh. it's for real. It's trademark like, a, like you wouldn't believe. Okay. So jiu-jitsu over here to me would be our, uh, um, instead of baseball, replace baseball and football. No Is kidding. that important? I because it there. makes every single person who does a martial art, you become so much more self-aware and so much more aware of other people. But not in a, gr a gross, like, kind of hanging it over people's heads. You're like, yeah, whatever. This guy can choke me out and kill me. I can choke him out and kill him. We don't fight each other because we're awesome. We know we can fight, so I don't have to fight physically or verbally. People who are into martial arts are into self-discipline and self-reflection, so they don't really worry about it, anything else. Like, eh, whatever, man. They're some of the most disciplined people in the public when we go to huge martial arts competitions in Chicago. These people are also super respectful and super disciplined. It's awesome. Yeah. Even the yeah. parents are super respectful and disciplined. Not all of them, but like 95% of the people are awesome people. Really cool people that I would like to emulate. So that's what I think martial arts would be amazing for everybody in America. For the whole world, really, but America for sure. And also knowing that uh, they can get punched in the face and not, not die. Yeah. You'll be right. Well, especially during COVID, like, so, oh, you know, yeah. whatever your perspective is, and I don't want to really want to get into a partisan argument over there, oh. but there's a lot of damage that came out of just having your kids at home for two years. Yes, sir. And yeah, now we just got to assimilate fun. them back into yeah. nine to 25, you know, yeah. uh, people <laughs> classes and be like, okay, just read this book and look at this chalkboard. Like, dude, yeah, hell no. Yeah, that so what would, what would putting a kid in jujitsu due to their mentality and their confidence and their they're, gonna learn. And they're not going to want to grab a gun they're not going to want to do exactly. things right they're going to actually work for their living and then they learn self respect excuse me self discipline and uh, those few things and actually chit chatting back and forth with people without trying to hurt them or trying to hurt themselves or being overwhelmed and just having tons of confidence gain self confidence is a huge deal I, I had fake self confidence forever now, I actually have true self-confidence, definitely because of martial arts. Also realizing all the things that I've done are actually really awesome, and I'm a super powerful person because of all the crappy things that I've gone through. It's it turned me into a superhero, leg a leg legitimate superhero, knowing all the things that I've gone through. So there's nothing that can stop me but me. 
So those things we learn in martial arts, and now, because of that, I don't want to hurt anyone ever. And if I have to, I'll talk my way out of it. I'll lose. I'll buy them a beer. I'll tell, tell them that I lose. So that's who I am now. I just navigate my way around, and I'm just really chill with everybody. Now, however, definitely a martial artist and definitely a, a warrior. So if I need to protect somebody, I'll protect some people from people who need protection. And you were doing that for almost a decade of your life, two decades ago. And, you know, you want to talk a little bit about that experience out there? Uh, in, you know? in the military? Yeah. Uh, in the military, I was, I was in the college, I was in college, University of Toledo, and I saw some U.S. Army Rangers floating down a boat in a boat at night, and I kind of am a type of person who always runs from things, yeah, but also I knew I needed to mature myself, but I was also didn't know at the time running from Huntington's. And because oh, my, dad, my dad was getting worse in Toledo, and I was just kind of didn't want to be there. So I saw that car, and I was like, well, let's see what they can do. So I was 17. Yeah, I was also really young because I graduated high school uh, early because the standards in Ohio are less than the standards here. So I graduated early. So I was in college a year early, still young and dumb, really dumb, and saw this army commercial. Hey, why not? Let's do that. Sounds like fun. I need a little. I need a kick in the ass. Honestly, I knew that for forever today. I knew I needed this. Big and this was ninety nine two thousand, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. So, so this is right before the big. Uh, yeah, before nine eleven. Yeah. Okay. So I joined the army in April of two thousand, but not as an army ranger because my dad had to sign the paperwork because I was still seventeen, and he said, "If I, you know, I'm a smart guy. I want to use my brains to." do something better than being an army ranger. But that would have been cool too. But anyway, uh, so I joined up as a military intelligence linguist. They sent me to language school to learn Spanish. It was a mouthful. Yeah, and uh, it's an insane job, I'll be honest. Like what we learn and all the crap that we do. So it was like a year of training, six months schools and language. And then they sent us to the NSA school in Texas. And it's just how to use the language to essentially gather information and to learn things about people and then uh, we got I went to airborne school to learn how to jump out of planes and then I got sent to the 82nd Airborne Division which was kind of cool pause hold on yes sir so your first time jumping out of a plane did you have a diaper on oh, <laughs> like no, I mean that's no. gotta be the reason why hey I, you're gonna yeah. jump out of a plane today <laughs> uh, can I get some of bologna yeah <laughs> like I was actually terrified of heights, legitimately. And so am I. Yeah, yeah, okay, so. But the reason I did it was because I'm terrified of heights. So I knew, meh, it'll, be, it'll get easier. It took like 10 years, but yeah, eventually I'm like, hey, okay. But yeah, my first couple of jumps were night jumps. I just closed Night my, jumps? Yeah, I closed, oh, which means no. I, closed, I closed my eyes. Oh, uh, oh, okay. Because I was terrified. My first jump was a day jump though, into a big field in Georgia. It was actually super nice. It's really weird, but once you jump, it's so peaceful and so quiet. You don't hear the plane at all once you realize your chute's open, and yeah. you're not, no, and you're not gonna hit anyone around. Like it's, just don't go into the blades. Yeah, right? yeah, it's so peaceful, so quiet, and you just float down to earth like a god coming from from above. Seriously, so quiet. So, so you're like one of those G.I. Joe dudes, right? Yeah, just just <laughs> landed in just flown, Omaha. Man. It was beautiful. Yeah. Wow. But it was terrifying also because definitely still scared of, well, really terrified of heights. Things that were out of my control with heights and stuff. Like once I figured it out, that was all my control. I was in control of all of that stuff. Things can still go wrong, but I had ways to mitigate those and make, make them all right. Did you have those, um, so you got like two strings you're pulling on, right? Uh, or well, that was, that's kind of the halo jump guys, the high altitude jumps. We did the regular air airborne stuff, which was, uh, the parachute was on my back and there's a line, a big cable in the airplane. And I'm connected to that with a wire from the back and oh, we're all connected. And when we jump out after four seconds, it pulls a parachute for us. So then, yeah, then we grab our titles ahead, ahead of once. So we're not jumping out and pulling our parachute like you see in the movies. Yeah. Some people do that, but not not the regular <laughs> airborne guys. Uh, it's more of a special forces airborne type of technique with an advanced airborne, or what's it called, military freefall. Yeah, military freefall. Not that. Just regular airborne. Yeah. Which is 
They jump you out 800 feet in combat time. Yeah, can you imagine how low that is? You can see my face from the ground when you're that low. 800 feet, so yeah. that's like your average skyscraper? or Barely. Wait, no. A little way no, lower. that's like... Super low, like a big tree, a giant tree maybe. Yeah. Oh, so you're talking like maybe three, four, five stories or something like that, like right? Like 10 stories up. 10 stories, okay. Yeah. That's, Sorry, yeah, my measurements are way no, off. No, <laughs> 10 stories at the most in combat jumps. In training, we jumped. Uh, so a, someone a could literally feet. just pick yeah. you off right there. But we did it at night, though, so they couldn't see us. At night. Oh, yeah. Jumping so our job was to, uh, in the 82nd Airborne, well, one, back in the day, I thought the place was kind of a joke because all they would do is talk about how cool we were in World War II, which was awesome to think. But it was kind of, it rang hollow to me yeah. back in the day. Trust me, I was, I was a very bad soldier then too. I, had no, I was a very, very piss poor soldier in the 80s. Now I realize it was actually kind of cool, but it was still kind of, it was uh, not cool for, if, unless you were infantry. If you were not infantry back in the day, uh, being in the 80s, it sucked because you didn't get anything. You didn't get zero training with the infantry. We got no training at all. Now they do because they realize it was a dumb idea to not mix everybody in. Now they mix everybody in so you know who you're working with overseas. But when I did it, we did nothing. It was actually really crappy. But the thing that was kind of weird and neat, actually, uh, the 82nd Airborne is the President's 911 troop. If something happens somewhere, like somebody takes over a country, they're gonna call up that new president and say, hey, if you don't leave, we're gonna call it, send in the 82nd. So it's a division that's chopped into three different brigades and one brigade at a time is on call. And that's what it does. It rotates call, rotates call, rotates calls. Every year, they were always on call. Status, uh, they call it DRF, or Division Ready Force, with two uh, backpacks, full, or uh, not backpacks, but uh, duffel bags full of gear, and a backpack, or an Alice pack full of uh, gear, ready for war at a moment's notice. And then when we would rotate off that, we would be on training status where we would just train and go to school and take some leave. Otherwise we had to be near, because we, we had to be anywhere in the world in 18 hours was our goal. 18 hours. Yeah. In so airplanes. if you're in Georgia, you got to be in Thailand yeah. in 18 hours yeah, or yes. Sochi, Russia or... Yeah, wherever. I'm, I'm trying to prove some of my geographical intelligence yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> pretty pretty crazy we won't allow if you're on call you're not we won't allow to anywhere go more, but more than a half an hour away. we can't go there yeah we're not allowed to go more than a half an hour away whoa but, yeah you're otherwise you get in trouble uh if you're on so call. you were uh, you guys were like an elite force then if you're yes. under that kind actually, of restrictions actually yeah i didn't realize it then but yeah it's actually an elite force it is and so what ha so what happens the day of 9-11 like do you just get a phone call like oh, hey uh grab your we, shovel, we thought we thought that was it right because <laughs> we were on drf1 <laughs> we we're ready to jump in to wherever but they, they didn't send us they didn't send us they did not send the 80 second not once uh while we we're on drf1 they did later on in 02 and 03 but they used green berets and cia and the 10th mountain group or 10th Mountain Division because they have mountain experience. Yeah. And 101st Airborne because they come with helicopters. We didn't come with helicopters, we just came, we came with a few helicopters, but not too many. Uh, so, but we were ready to go, but we, they didn't send us. So, so, so what are you, waited. where are you at in 9-11? Uh, North Carolina, Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Okay. At a gas range, uh, CS. I don't know what that stands for, but it's like the worst pepper spray for your face. And it's a range with a little shed, and there are no windows or doors. They're all, it's all closed up. Yeah. And you go and then you take your protective mask off to feel the effects of the really bad gas, the pepper gas, and say something loud. You got to say your last so, name and your social security number. So hard things you're making you immune to. Well, not this. really. They're letting you know that your equipment actually works. So then you got to take your equipment off, your gas mask off, and then put it back on. And then you feel fine. After you that. feel fine. Well, it still burns a lot, but yeah, you can breathe. And then you gotta leave. And so it it makes you realize that sucking uh, is not so bad. 
And so, so, you so, so fight, you're in there, there pretty them. much torturing yourself. Yes, sir. And then <laughs> you get the call, like, hey, yeah. um, something's happening in New York, P- yeah. Shanksville, Pennsylvania, and Washington, D.C. Yeah, we got back to the base, to our, or to our barracks, and one of the, the sergeants ran out, and he's like, whoa, one of our t- towers in New York City just fell down. So most of us <laughs> go, oh, well, that must be an accident. That's crazy. And then they say, oh, no, another one, another plane hit. This is not an accident. What the fuck? This two planes hit, and I've been to New York City a few times. So, and yeah. my aunt was married in the Twin Towers. Oh wow! So I, was, it was horrible to hear that because she lived there right next to, did not there but pretty close to where it was. So a lot of my family was there, and uh, I, it was crazy to hear that, and they were fine from that. But still, a lot of her family died from that actually. I'm uh, sorry to hear that. Yeah. Wow, I didn't know that. Insane. Wow. But. Uh, yeah, a really crazy story. But, but as, as someone that's actively training for years on end, and some of these guys are sitting around, not sitting around, but a lot of these guys are like ready oh, for like we years. Sit we do. We definitely do a lot of sitting. Okay, a lot so of sitting. when that happens, it's like, okay, testosterone, send adrenaline, us. go send time, us. let's, let's ride. They did not send us up. Yeah. Yeah, we're so pissed off. We're so <laughs> pissed. So pissed. So, but, so 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 the Clinton peacetime years, you guys are just like, man, yeah, I just want to go, 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 right? Yeah, yeah, it was nuts. We should have been there, but it is what it is, and they want they want us in reserve for whatever. So when you so again. when do you finally get the call to go to Afghanistan? January two thousand three. Okay. Uh, I was actually in Afghanistan for the first time in my life. Thought it was gonna be like jumping into Vietnam and you know, like craziness, but no, it was super cool. No, did you know any of the Pashtun language? Did you no, know? No, but we. You're probably surprised I even know that word. Oh, yeah. right? <laughs> but, but we learned a lot. Actually, we got a bunch of dictionaries and these little phrase letters that would say words and sentences out loud, and so we would practice. We were definitely practicing a lot. Like, open the door. Is he yeah. here? You yes, know, yeah. OBL <laughs> <laughs> stuff. I'm sure you like learned that, that phrase. Right? Definitely, lots of Zingi, Jurip, Khale. Hello, how are you? Oh, yeah. doing well. So I, you know, in in movies they don't ever show like the real detail, but I'll, I'll listen to Jocko. I'm, I love Jocko, yeah. and yeah, I you love know, that stuff. Um, and so he's like, it's not kicking a door, start shooting everybody like in the movies. Like you have to get the trust and the culture of the yes. community you land in. Yeah, and then they have to tell you, hey, such and such is over here, and exactly. this is where you need to go. And That's it's like a building. Like almost like in a church, we call it discipling or, or culturing through like a corporation. Yes, yeah. You have to train the people and get their by with kind of like through. that movie in the Green Zone with Matt Dillon. Like like he's like showing you how he's getting to know yes. the people, it, and it's stuff's really interesting, right? Yeah, special forces they call it by with and through. You work by with and through uh, the, the in, indigenous forces there. So the Afghan tribes and the Afghan populace, wherever you are, wherever you're assigned, those are your your new people, your new crew, your new family. And yeah, you got to be real light at first and do what you got to do to make them friends, whatever you got to do, do their silly games, have some silly uh, food with them, play some silly brain games, beat some people up that they don't like, whatever, whatever you got to do, or maybe bring them some medicine or help their daughter or something very special to get connected with those people and then you're their friend for life and they'll do whatever they need to do for you and that's what they love to do well uh, all of us like that like to do is just build friendships and that's it in relationships yes sir I would hire them in a second I wish right. I could hire like a, like an Afghan graphic <laughs> designer with my company I mean oh, yeah. I would because the work ethic oh yeah I mean come that's on true. they're not gonna they're gonna <laughs> come here and work 90 yeah. hours a week they're not gonna commit any crimes guaranteed yeah. like it ain't happening like yeah, they're not coming from Afghanistan some of the most hospitable oh. most Oh my God! People who just had like one chicken, and they would share their eggs with us, and they would cook us huge meals. They just had a chicken to, to feed their family, and they chopped them all up, and we had giant barbecues. Bro, it was so cool in 03. Really nice. They were literally loved us being there to help them out. But 03, so you're there a year. So America's there a year and a half, just destroying everything over there, and then they're yeah. they're just sitting there hanging out and, and they loved it. making you some curry and just yeah, eating whatever. They, they right? loved it. It was nice because we weren't too aggressive or we weren't trying to kill everybody. We we're just trying to help them out. If they needed something, if some bad guys popped up, we'll help you fight off some bad guys. You know, if they, there were no bad guys. There were a couple, but not really, not really. 
So did you get in like in the mountains and? Oh yeah, all over in 03. That was, that was our job was we had really heavy backpacks with really heavy radios to listen, well one, to report information to our chain of command and also to listen to bad guys' radio communications. So we're always listening to their communications. So we'd go with the- Bad infantry. guys meaning Al-Qaeda. Uh, Al-Qaeda and Taliban. Yeah, Taliban, for really anybody. Good or bad, because we need to know the good guys and the bad guys. Because if the good guys do. mess up and say something wrong, you got to be like, hey, don't say that again. Get out of here. Exactly. You know, go back to yeah. Alaska. Don't let them get killed. <laughs> exactly. Uh, we got to know their intent. So sometimes you can't know that by being an infantry guy and shooting people or, or pointing your rifle at their face. So you got to go in there with honey to get the bees, right? Yes, sir. Yeah, there you go. So we're up there listening. And then the infantry scouts are there to look with binoculars and look around and just make sure everything's good to go while we're up in the mountains listening to bad guys communicate on radios with an interpreter and uh, finding out where the bad guys are and what they're doing. But in 03, nothing. We had nothing. No bad guys. Not at all. Were they gone or were they, they coming they were, back? They were in Pakistan mostly. And there were some things happening in Pakistan. I think two of our guys were killed in 03. And that was from Pakistan. They would shoot over uh, rockets and ambush some of us, but it was really um, super peaceful in 03. Very, very peaceful. Even in Kandahar City, we could walk around and nobody, I didn't feel like people were trying to kill me at all. Interesting. So there wasn't much combat from the day you get there to the day you leave? No, not at all. It was honestly like a sportsman's dream. I could have been there hunting and just loving the visual. Oh, it's beautiful, uh, right? Uh, oh, the valleys in Afghanistan has got to be just... And the food. Uh, the oh, uh, yes. I would love it to go so and have some yes. whatever. Uh, Chicago, some uh, lamb. Yes. Some shawarma, lamb and goat. Right? Oh, yes. Sir. <laughs> the lamb and goat was the best. Yeah. The spices. Oh, yes. Yeah. Really good stuff. So that's 03. Uh, again, I think we didn't really have too many things going on over there at that time. But really, they were building up their forces and training in Pakistan, or probably Iran both, and uh, learning and learning and learning uh, us and learning how to work around us. And 04, in the 80s, I went to Iraq. I learned, I listened to Iraq build up in Afghanistan from our radio while walking around. Yeah. So we're in Iraq in 05. Yeah. Uh, is it still, is it recording? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah cool. It's fine, I get it. So Iraq, 05. Uh, went there. I could have definitely gone elsewhere. Uh, went to a little base called Fab Kelsu. But, but first we went to this giant base. And there you could smell the military... Uh, uh, crap. Oh, industrial complex? Yeah, the MIC. You could see, it was a huge place and you could just see all the way to Texas. It was really gross. Really gross. It was like a little city of people there just making tons of money over hand over fist instead of fighting the war. And the same exact thing happened in Afghanistan because it makes people money. War is definitely a racket for a lot of people. It's a big grift, but most of us are not in on the grift. So so Eisenhower, the military industrial complex, and Smedley Butler war is a racket. They weren't lying. Not at all. Yeah, <laughs> that was very true. However, the military industrial complex does do really amazing things. I like what they create. They've created tons of awesome stuff. However, they should not run our government at all. Not even a little tiny bit. But the things that they do and they, they create is actually pretty sweet. But they should, should have zero say over what we do because they do that for themselves to the detriment of us, the poor dummies. So I'm in Iraq in 05 seeing all this stuff. And that's when IEDs became a huge deal over there. And I'm at this little tiny base. Explain was, to the public what the sure. acronym for IED is. IED is Improvised Explosive Device. And anything you can make blow up, they'll make blow up. So bicycles, goats, dogs, children, babies at funerals, coffins. Are uh, you serious? Oh, yeah. Pepsi cans. Anything you can think of. Funerals? Coffins? Oh, yes, sir. Yeah. Funerals and coffins. Definitely. Dead so dogs, you have like hundreds of innocent people going to mourn mm -hmm. yes, the sir. senior fellow that got killed by an IED. Yeah. And there's an IED and the casket blowing up. Yeah. You have no idea. Everything blows up over there. 
Everything blows up. And how long was that? Go- that was going on the whole time we Most came into the second. Yeah. Yes. Iraq. The second Iraq. The entire time. So the whole time. So we got like these thousands of of prisoners that were marching through in the nineties, the Persian Gulf. When we were kids, watching Saddam Hussein yeah. and CNN. And I, I mean, we're we're kids watching this on TV and the yellow bands everywhere. But you get there in 03 and you're seeing a totally different picture. Like yeah. these are not. Um, these are not weak people. These are people that are very serious about yeah, what they're doing. That was nuts. There were cool people there too in, in Iraq. Very nice people, but very smart people. And they've been screwed over many a time. So they know what their bread is, buddy. So sometimes they'd be bad guys at night. Sometimes they'd be bad guys. Pretend to be good guys, but they're definitely bad guys over there too. And yeah, they learned the ID probably from Iran and Pakistan. More than likely Iran. I uh, don't, honestly, I don't put it past them because that's just who they are. And uh, what is that say, old saying? One man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's yeah. Very, very true until the day we die of World War Three of, of nuclear war. Well, hopefully it won't get to that, so yeah. we don't have to. Our, my, sure. my, my grandchildren will be fighting over sticks <laughs> and stones. Right. Yeah, hopefully we don't get to uh, that. But I wreck. Our little job was to listen to bad guys and to see if they were coming or doing anything. Um, the one thing that did happen though was an I uh, we sent out a patrol of our guys to listen to walk down the road, and that's always what we do. We set out patrols to make sure the bad guys aren't creeping on us, so they know we are outside of the wire. If you stay inside the wire, then the bad guys start creeping way too close. So we always push outside and we make a presence known. Because if you're going to be right here in this house, now you got to walk the block. So your neighbors know you walk the block. If you don't, if you just stay in the house, then the neighbors go, okay, cool. They don't go outside. So we're just going to take over the street. I'm going to go over that street. And eventually the bad guys will be everywhere. And we will not be able to go out because if we do, we'll die. So we always have to go out, out, out. But the infantry guys went out and they did a patrol and they checked out a car and uh, a box exploded and killed five of them. Uh, that was crazy because I was listening and I could hear their communications on our machine. And I was right outside the front of the gate and it was very loud. There was a huge boom and I could smell it and I could hear their communications on our radio. And so I was li- listening to what they were saying and it was pr- pretty messed up, really messed up. And those were some of your great friends, right? I assume. Uh, yeah, actually, there were a couple of some good guys that I had had some pretty good uh, chit chats with. Uh, people that I was learning to learning more about their lives and stuff. One guy just had a kid. That West. Yeah, and two other, two guys did survive. They both lost the little, their middle leg. Actually, one dude lost the right leg, and another dude lost the left leg. Uh, but the two guys, one guy in the middle, he died. Corey Mirachek, he was cool. He was an engineer. Spe- speaking of, I, I have to uh, jump in with this. Sure. So, we talk a lot about passion and purpose and how your whole life's kind of like you've had this almost like reborn experience with hunting. Does even yes. though it's, it's oh, bad, yes. but it's good f- like for your morale, right? Yes. So, I I uh, I did a lot of reading about like the human conditions and societies and whatnot. And there was a study done with, and they did. I think they took a hundred amputees and they took a hundred lottery winners. And they studied them over five years. Their happiness levels were the same. What? I could, oh, wow. I guess I could see Think that. about that. Yes, I could totally see that. That's nuts. That is, I mean, it, it just shows you money <laughs> is. Whew. Yeah, it's nothing. It, it's just, it, you gotta have a little money to help survive. Uh, yeah, but, I mean, you don't but, wanna be poor. Yeah. 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 You want to pay your bills and have some food. Yeah. But to pursue that or to be like super rich. Yeah, I'd much rather be have experiences, good and bad experiences, and learn and learn and learn. Well, it contrasts, it builds character, it shows yes, you sir. the determination, yeah. the grit, you know. People, wow. who, yeah, yes, people who grew up wealthy generally are people who have like really bad drug problems now, yeah, yeah, or they're dead because they died from fentanyl or whatever, yeah. Or, 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 or and, and, and the, the sickest part that I see about a, a lot of the wealthy is like there's no empathy. Like uh, anybody true. anybody could just Google and see what Kandahar looks like. But to actually know what the people there are like uh, and they actually know the people that actually went on the front lines are there, 
Because you got an evil government on one side and you got, you know, the good guys, quote unquote, us yeah. coming in. But the actual people on the ground that are actually walking in those homes and, and eating sides of lamb, yes, that's where humanity is. Yes, it's not in the bureaucratic is. offices hey, yes. or in yeah, the tunnels. That's one thing definitely that uh, I've learned through all my years over there, and especially in 06. Not one thing when the bullets are coming back at us or somebody's shooting at us or bombing us. It has zero to do with country, God or country. Zero. Absolutely yeah. zero to yeah. do with that. It's just this person here and that person there. My brothers and sisters to the left and to the right of me. That's all that matters when that happens. Nothing else matters. Not my unit. Not the Americas. Not the flag. Nothing matters. Not just these guys. It's and literally me. existential. Yes. Right? You're not uh, thinking about the Constitution when you're like thinking about yeah, the IED, no, right? Like it doesn't... Not at all. Nothing at all like that bullshit. It's just straight up survival. Me and these guys right here. That's it. My guys and me. That's it. We've got to survive and we got to do, kill to survive, honestly. Unfortunately. Man. So how do, you, how do you reconcile with all that? Like, you know, obviously you got PTSD and, 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 and you know, it, growing up, we always saw the Vietnam veterans because that was the era we, we yes, got educated definitely. in. And definitely. you saw what happened to them. And you see them in the wheelchairs at the highway exit. And, you know, obviously the, a lot of them are charlatans. But some of these guys, you're just like, dude, uh, like a black guy from Vietnam, you know he was in the worst barracks, fought his life over there, comes back, goes on a racially segregated bus, yeah. and we just wow. shit all over him. Yeah. Like, all you just got to feel for this guy, right? Like He's Definitely. Especially those guys, the whole generation of Vietnam vets. When they came home, they actually not just the black guys, but the entire uh, anybody who went over here. It was culture, right? Like it's yeah, they weren't they weren't given the freedoms that we have now. They weren't given like the GI bills and stuff, and they weren't given VA benefits because it wasn't considered a war. If you remember, oh. that. yeah, they even though we they, made trillions yes. off that Bell yeah. helicopter, how much money they oh, made? Oh yes, we weren't allowed to make. They're not called the war. Because it technically didn't go through Congress, right? Yes, oh, wow. So I never they, even so knew so that. I never they knew that. Couldn't get VA benefits for years. People who came not back. Not even VA benefits? No, not. Guys who came back couldn't get VA benefits because even they had no legs or whatever. Yeah. I it did blew not my know mind that. when I heard I that. I did not know that. And the Gulf of Tonkin, that was all BS. All, oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, crappy. Yeah. Black Ops, yeah. Yes, sir. All just yeah. to get us over there. It is what it is. I mean, I, I don't really like communism, but there was definitely some other ways to do that. Yeah. Instead of it was more it was a special forces world war. That's what it was. And they turned it into a conventional war. And that's what they did in Afghanistan. Afghanistan was a special forces war. Small strategic tack down. Get in, get up, build a force and we're done. But they turned it into a big conventional war because that's where the money is. Same exact thing in Vietnam that happened in Afghanistan. I bet it broke your heart when you saw that last plane oh my God. last year. Yeah, all was, the work you did for all those people not, that just sacrificed blood and tears. their own people, their own blood, their own neighborhoods. Yes, sir. And how many thousands that get left horrific, back? Right? Horrific, horrific. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not taking shots at any administration because no, 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 it was knows. definitely time. But the way yeah. they did that was oh, especially horrible. the last picture of everybody in one plane. Like, come on, yeah. are you serious? Yeah, like, why do you have to? So ridiculous. Oh. Granted, that was 19 years too late, but they, well, did, they yeah. did it wrong. Very, very wrong. Uh, yeah, I definitely should uh, be chastised for that. I, I'm a big fan now of uh, holding our higher-ups accountable. Yeah. Anybody who's above us, especially in the government, hold those guys accountable. No it's going to be hard to do that with <laughs> if we don't yes. change our election system, if we don't change, like, like I was talking to you before, even before we started recording, it's like, why do we have to, what, couldn't, couldn't we do like a three-day voting thing? Okay, you go there, you, you sit in the poll for an hour, you have these 50 things you vote about, and then like, you know, you eliminate the pork, you eliminate the bureaucracy, but then right. you eliminate the power, you eliminate the money, and that's the exactly. whole thing that runs it. That's the, that's <laughs> the grease that runs the machine, right? So it's like, yes, sir, I'm right. running in circles. I'm a total libertarian, but a yeah. libertarians are lame ducks. They'll never do anything, right? It's like, yeah, it, the system's built that way. Right. It is because they, they, they made it that way, and we 
we since Eisenhower said no, it was FDR. I'm pretty sure it was FDR. Said when he was passing the New Deal, said, "Hey, I'm gonna do this thing for you guys, but you need to make sure that I do it, do every single thing that I say." And we've forgotten that. We haven't held anybody up since then. And we don't really watch them. We're like, eh, whatever. They're, they've got my best interest in that. No, they don't. They might at first, but even me, I'm a really good guy now. Super kind person, but if I do the same thing over and over, I'm going to figure out my limits, my left and right limits, and where can I go to get around and to make more for me. I'm going to always figure out how to make more for me. Once I'm in a, little, a position for long enough, I can figure out my baseline limits and now how I can go around and figure out how to make more benefits for me and my family. And that's how every human being is. We're all super, super tribal. Well, yeah. and, 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 and I always go back to my grandfather's generation because he raised me. So pretty much I'm like a grandchild of a depression kid. You know? <laughs> and I, I'm 40 or almost 40, but I feel like I'm 60 because like all the, all the guys I grew up <laughs> around. And, you know, they, yeah. they talk about their war and, and the rations and the like, you know, you're only allowed to have, you know, this much water and this much milk. And they had to go through That's prohibition and all that stuff. Right. Insane. But they talk about how prosperous the nation was after mm. the war. We haven't seen that since World War Two, if yes, I'm not sir. correct. I mean, you're we totally definitely right. didn't see it during Vietnam. Not at all. And yeah, totally right. our prices just keep on going up and up and up. And it's just like we don't even. Yes. Back like, who they, wins? The corporations the middle, win. middle class we had back then. They actually oh. cared. Oh, Now yeah. there's no middle yeah. class. Yeah, that 1940s and the 1940s and 1950s. Oh, yeah. And then it all went away. You could make a really good living making automobiles in Detroit. Can, you no, know, if you if you would have told someone in 1940 that Detroit was going to be like it was in 1990, they would have laughed at you. We <laughs> right? just won the war. We own all yeah. steel. Like Mexico is not even a thing because uh, we don't yeah. even like that's just our neighbor. Like yeah. we're not sending, you know, 90 percent of our GDP there, and we wonder why we have high inflation yeah. and high gas prices, right? Right. Like yeah. you would have never thought. I mean, Detroit, and I've been there many times and drove around that city. I had a lot of friends there. And, you know, that infrastructure was not made for the middle class. It was made for high class. Like, yes, there sir. is not a transportation oh, system there. The Everybody was balling and making yeah. money. <laughs> oh, yeah. like, we just won the war. We got steel. We got we got rubber. We got Henry Ford. Yeah, like, it's everything. like it was, we're it undestructible, was, right? But, it was the know, place to be yeah, forever. Yeah. But then you get corrupt unions. You get oh, high prices, yeah. you know. Yeah. Our, our pride, we don't want to compete with Toyota. You know? yeah. It's just like so, better vehicles. It was also, they took all of our manufacturing jobs away because it's cheaper for the, the top bottom line. They get a little bit more money at the top just to send their jobs to Mexico or China or whatever. I mean, that's cool. They need jobs too. But, oh, yeah, yeah. But hold on. Let's keep those here because we might need those later when yeah. something like a pandemic happens or World War Three happens. We, exactly. might need to, we might need to make a few things here and uh, get back to that. Now, now, can you imagine if our GDP was like, you know, 50 during COVID? It wouldn't even oh, matter. Yeah, like, right? boom, we're good. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Build true. a couple of hospitals and we're you know, yeah, right. isolating, you know, no shutdowns, no lockdowns, just yeah. isolated, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure it's a little harder than that, but right. I mean, we but, took polio out, right? Yeah, yes. <laughs> When we're really focused, when we're very, when we're laser focused, and we uh, we're all together on something instead of divisive, which we are now. If we're laser focused, like how do we kill pol or how we kill polio or how we went to the moon. Uh, that is the human beautiful thing about human beings all over because we can really come together and use our brains to better ourselves or get ourselves in trouble. And it doesn't feel like we've had that unity no. in about 21 years. 9-11 yes, was like the last time I feel like. And before that was the golf. <coughs> or perfect yeah, golf. definitely. Unless you were a Muslim uh, after 9-11, then you got beat up. Uh, or like yeah, a sheik. Yeah. You know, so and, and... The Sikhs got beat up. While, you know, while, while we're here but talking about that, some, some you know... If, if Muslims are such bad people, I think the last two years during COVID, they would have did something. Yeah, I, right. I hate all this Islamic, yeah. Islamic phobia. This, it's, 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 it's a joke by the... It's not a joke for them, no. but it's, 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 it's horrible how the media portrays yeah. these people. It makes it's, our it's, people it's afraid and it makes, yeah. it makes us divisive. Yeah. And if we're yeah. afraid and we're divisive, then we're easier to control. 
This is dumb. You know, I go often. I go up to um, a place called uh, West Ridge. It's it's mm-hmm. like the northern tip of, of Chicago. It's up by Evanston, Rogers Park. There, they call it Little India, and Sweet. there's more. There's probably like twenty different kind of Arabs up there. You got Jews, you got Palestinians, you got Africans, uh, th- like 30, 40 different kinds of African uh, countries that are meeting over there. And no wars. Right. No race problems. Ha. No fighting. You got Palestinians and Jews yeah. that are hanging out and going to. In Jerusalem. All over there. Uh, yeah. And no fighting. It's right. like the Gaza Strip up there. Really? No one's fighting each other. Everybody's know. at peace. They're Americans, and they want money, and they want freedom, right? That's, That's why they come here. Wow. Main reason is money, I would say. I would you come to America. <laughs> if you ask any immigrant, why do you come to America? Oh, you know, I love my country, blah, 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 blah. Why would you come here? Money, 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 <laughs> money. Everyone yeah. wants to make money. Why not? Let's make some money, yeah. right? So, like, yeah, the, the media guessing. is always trying to get us to fight over every little thing, and you know it. I mean, yes, you sir. went to these places. Definitely. Yeah, and I've there, been all the there's world. differences, but people hate each other. Why? Like, the media is, is a big part of this, right? Oh, 100%. Definitely. I mean, we are all very tribal. Every human being across oh, the world, yeah, the world yeah. is very tribal. Tribal is the... Yeah, However, that's... we are so much... And everyone knows this, too. We are so much more alike yes. than we are different. 100%. 100%. But people, elites and powerful, want to stay elite and powerful, so they divide us up. <laughs> media says, oh, black versus white. Africans versus Americans, whatever they want to say, whatever they want to do, whatever's cool nowadays. It's, now it's all the gays and stuff like that, which yeah. is it's cool. You do you, but don't make it a big political deal. Because yeah. we all live on this thing. No one's on a pedestal. No one is on a pedestal. No one can live on a pedestal. We're all the same. And, and we're all, all very of, weak. Yeah. We want to say we're strong, true. but listen, I'm yeah. I'm weak. Right well, now, I'm yes, going sir. through some of the hardest times of my life. You wouldn't even know it because mm-hmm. I, I'll put a facade on. Yes, but this sir. last quarter year has been brutal oh, wow. for my I'm sorry, <laughs> self-wise. It's just oh, I'm everywhere, like right? Mental health but or physical health, or both. I'm just stressed out. I'm gotcha. just I'm just incredibly yes, stressed out. I mean, it's yeah. just, I'm running around in circles. Yeah, and, but, sorry, but it man. but it looks but, good on the outside though, right? Yeah, you know. So it, and it's just like once we know that weakness, we could we could go in there and fix it somehow. Yes, sir. The elites you capitalize know. on that stress, though. Uh, they capitalize yeah. on that divisiveness, yeah. and now yeah. you don't think right. You don't think right. So if you're stressed out and running 12 hours a day, that's good for everyone else, but you, or all of us are the poor people, trying to make a living, make an end, our ends meet. And let's tie that back to Huntington's disease, because if you're stressed out, you're, you're not going to survive. Oh, that's right. Yeah. If I let Huntington's take over, and sometimes I've done that because I've stressed myself out. <laughs> Just thinking about craziness or things that I did or things that I didn't do or whatever. And then, yeah, Huntington steers my ship. Oh, that's bad. When I allow Huntington to steer my ship, things get nutty and I want to blame everything on Jessica or anybody I can see nearby. Nearby, Jessica's my wife uh, or my dog or uh, or my neighbor. And yeah, I'll just, ah, I want to yeah. bite them and bite their head off. But it's all me. I'm so it's raging. It's, it's cloudy. So everybody yes. deals with that in yes. some ways. Yes. But if you, it will literally mentally affect your physical health. Definitely. If you let it take yes. over. Yes. I'll get pains all over my body. My chest will hurt. Are you serious? My legs will hurt. Oh, every, everywhere will hurt. My whole body will hurt. Because I need to relax my body. I need to be in like a, essentially a meditative state. Totally relaxed uh, mentally and physically. Otherwise, my body goes, and I can't do that. So I have to be really chill, like I am super drunk or kind of high on the marijuana. So Huntington's almost seems like the most conscious you could possibly be physically and mentally. Yeah. It, and yeah. it's weird. Like, I, I make a joke about no, that, which is not. But it's yeah, like right. you, you talk to hyper-spiritual people, and, and you, you talk to people that are involved in and, and chiropractics and, and uh, like, like acid. Right, and they're like, "Oh, I was so conscious in my whole life; I could feel my whole body just expressing it." Or if they're really tense and stressed out, so hunting stints, it just rises the cream to the top, and you feel it more than anything. Then, yes, I know that all, de- the, all that stuff was a lot, but no, that makes sense. That makes a lot of wow. sense. Absolutely. Wow, yeah, and I can use that for good, or I can use it for bad. 
So I'm very uh, self-aware now, and I uh, use that to for good now. Use my anxieties and depression and stuff, my stubbornness. Use all those craziness things for good now. To fight at the gym, to teach people how to fight their own anxieties, the way that I've been doing it for years. And uh, actually trying, if uh, trying to go to school again to get a degree in psychology to become a uh, psychologist, oh, a sports psychologist to help people get past things in the gym and on the mats and stuff and to become their own warrior. That's what I'm trying to do too. Just for, really just for fun. So you're, let, let me get this straight. You're, you're 40 years old. You're, you're dealing with this Huntington's disease. Yes, sir. And this is something that uh, makes people peril at a certain age. Like a young age. Yes. I'll and be. you're worried about getting a psychology degree. Yeah. <laughs> like, It'll be fine. I, I'm, a, I'm a lifelong learner. Okay. And a lifelong martial artist. So I'll always be going, doing something more and more, doing something more and more physically and mentally. And if I can do it and make and help a couple other people, that'd be pretty cool. While helping myself. Wow. That's what my book is too, is to help other people. My book is, uh, and that's why I'm, all my stories are, are pretty upfront. And now I'm an open book on every single thing in my life, but Jessica, every single thing in my world is uh, open besides her. Uh, you uh, gotta protect your family, you have to. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Uh, so, 2005, went to Iraq. That was BS, watched my friends die. Came back. Uh, then I moved to San Antonio, Texas. Oh, wow. For nice. a year. Yeah, I went to the NSA there, and uh, the people were awesome, but the job sucked. Yeah. The people were really cool. I loved working with those people there, but I just didn't like working you in You didn't a, get a chance to run no, snow I didn't like working there, did in a, I didn't like working. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't say the name. We'll I be in a Russian like, airport in 10 hours. <laughs> I didn't like working in a windowless building with a bunch of weak, weak babies, I guess. Because I was a weak baby myself, but I didn't want to be in charge of a bunch of weak babies like myself. So I needed some more hard, hardcore people near me. I didn't need other weak people like me. So I re-enlisted again uh, to go to the 7th Special Forces Group, but as a, not as a Green Beret, but as a military intelligence nerd. So that's what I did in 2005. And then that was the most awesome thing in my life, going to the special operations world. All the uh, jobs over there and all the training and training we got was sweet. We got lots of cool things over there. It was awesome. They really cared about their people and they really took their people seriously. It was sweet. Uh, went to some driving schools, shooting schools, uh, some different things like that. Survival and resistance and escape schools. Uh, Tracking schools, a lot of different things are sweet. Have and you ever thought about going on Survivor? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you already know all that stuff, right? Uh, that would be kind of fun. <laughs> yeah. Win a million bucks to hang out. Yeah, just drop me in the middle of the Sahara Desert. <laughs> oh, don't worry about this. I did that in Iraq. <laughs> this is nothing. <laughs> I might actually. Now, now try doing that in uh, Antarctica. Yeah. Have fun doing that one or, or you know, Sochi, Russia or something like no, that. <laughs> I think I prefer the warmth. Yeah. So you like uh, the but, but I would be all right in the yeah. cold, but I would I would not like it. My body gets all angry in the cold. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I gotta yeah. say, super toasty. Like I see your jacket there has the you've got the uh, yeah the the, um, uh, the inner liner the Columbia yeah, liner. Dude, yeah, that's I the love best. That. Yeah, I, right. I need to make myself a uh, ba baked potato. Yeah. So this so these I two shirts it. are probably like a hundred and hundred and fifty dollars total two hundred. I got them at Goodwill for like eight bucks. <laughs> no way. Love are you Goodwill. Serious? <laughs> there you I'm, go. I'm telling you, I, yes, I, I hood will hunt on a, like a weekly basis. Oh, yes. I, it's, I, <laughs> I love, love it. it. There you go. I found some good yeah, stuff there. Never yeah. pay full price for anything ever. No, never, ever. I'm, I'm telling you, I my, my grandfather that. raised me like in this depression mindset. And I, I don't go buy like eight cartons of, you know, milk or, you know, stuff like that. But <laughs> I, yeah, I, I don't That's like great. to just spend money on just yeah, nothing. Yeah, definitely. No purpose. Looking for yeah. Looking for some sweet deals. I like that. Yeah, I need uh, a couple of those shirts actually to turn myself into a baked potato. Wow. Nice and toasty. Wow. Uh, Special Forces, Seven Special Forces Group in North Carolina, Fort Bragg, North Carolina. 
Each special forces group is regionally oriented. So Seventh Group was oriented towards South America, Central America, and uh, well, the Americas. Everyone there spoke Spanish. Uh, and then Third Group, most of those guys spoke different uh, African languages or Arabic or French because okay. that's where they mo because they were oriented towards Africa. Wow. Fifth Group was oriented towards the Middle East, and Tenth Group was oriented towards Europe. So they speak like Russian and German or whatever. Is it true that we didn't have this during the nineties before nine eleven? Oh, we did. No, we definitely did. We've had the Green okay. Berets since. So that since whole since like we didn't have. We didn't have Arabic intelligence. That's a bunch of oh, garbage. Yeah, okay. No, okay. no, we've definitely have always had that, our that's eyes. That's the thing we, you you know you hear in the yeah. conspiracy world. Now we've like, always had okay. our eyes and ears all over the world. Okay. To collect, collect the information. And they get sources and stuff to see what people need yeah. in order to... So uh, we've been police... Like Ron Paul would say, oh, we've yeah. been policing the world for decades. Yes, so, yeah. Well, yeah, we, we get involved because it makes money. But we should definitely have intelligence assets all over, but just not killing people. Yeah. Or making people corrupt or making them stupid or turning them into somebody who is bad. But definitely knowing what's going on, good. So just don't kill people. Yeah. Some people need to be killed, though, honestly. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. but most people are good. I'd say 75% of the world is good. Yeah. Honestly. Just want to be left alone and have a, have a good old life, raise a family. Do you, have you ever had, like, so I'll, I'll, I'll read these transcripts of some of the guys at Gitmo, and, you know, it's fascinating just to see their perspective and their point of view. Did you ever have any of that interaction with, like, some of the quote unquote bad guys where you're just like, you know what? If I was in that guy's shoes, I'd probably think the same way. Uh, definitely. Because it's all tribal. That, oh, definitely. Christian, Muslim, yeah, yes. American, and Israel. I mean, it's there, all in Afghanistan. They're super tribal within their their country. It's all matters of uh, what what tribe you're in over there, as well as here. Every, the entire world is super tribal. All humans are, whether you think it or not, you're super tribal. Wow. Yeah. All the big liberals at the colleges and stuff all the big college professors are all super tribal yeah they don't think they are but they are they're just as prejudiced yeah. and racist as the next exactly. guy they just don't, they're just not branded on the news like that you exactly know? we're all tribal we try to be cool but we're all super tribal because that's how I survive so yeah it's nutty and uh, our people at the top I think use that against us also to help keep us dumb he was down. The whole, um, what was the thing you were telling me about the Veterans and Athletes? What, oh, tell me about that. Veterans and Athletes United is a program that my buddy started, or my brother started. James Howard is his name. Okay. And he's a, uh, he was a, uh, going training to be a Green Beret captain in the Army. And then he got, he broke his neck uh, swimming at an accident. Uh, swimming, yeah. Really sweet guy, amazing human being, just one of the most important people in the world. And he started that to help get the word out there. And what they do is they raise money and then they have like outings at the beach or in the mountains and where essentially you just veg out and completely forget about the world and come together and chit chat a little bit, eat together. It's so fun, so relaxing and just so cathartic to talk to people who have the same Sorry. stories. Yeah. And you just learn more stories and you get over your stories and they get over their stories and, and it's better. It's really better after we leave. It's always the same. So James Howard does that with his vets and Athletes United. Wow. That's, that's really encouraging because, uh, you know, I, I, I did some speeches to uh, some of the, actually I'm going to meet with a lady in a, in a few hours that we've set on a, um, a not-for-profit board where we go and we talk to kids and mentor kids in prison and I'll yeah. tell guys, I said, listen, you show me your friends, I'll show you your future. You're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. And I don't care what that average is or what, what you guys are doing. You know, you're hanging around with, you know, uh, people in, in, in your groups that some people, some of your friends have Huntington's, right? I would assume. Uh, yeah. Virtually, yeah. you know, yeah. you'll talk to them. Yes. And that's a support group. Yes, sir. And if you don't have that support group, it's hard to get that perspective of someone that's like doing something positive with that. Because you could sit here in a ball and be like, dude, I'm just dying. Right, or you could sit there and be like, "No, I'm living." It's like, um, yeah. What's what's the prison movie that everybody loves? It's like voted the most popular movie ever. Uh, um, Shawshank. Oh, Shawshank. So yes. get, get busy living or get busy dying, right? Yeah, it's right. like, 
That is I the, can live or I can die. That. that is the truth. You know? Yeah. Um, that's true. So it, it's just interesting. How do you tap into that piece of your brain, that on-off switch that's like, okay, I'm in this horribly... So Nelson Mandela, right? Yeah. I don't know much about the guy, but I know he was in prison for like 30 years. He's got that whole Joseph and Asur story, right? Yeah. So like, how do you stay motivated on a daily basis knowing you're <laughs> almost never going to get out of here? You're yeah. recognized as like a terrorist in some you know parts of the world, whatever. And But you still have that smile. You still have that spirit. You still have your soul. With Huntington's disease, what is that thing in your brain that you just... I'm doing it. Uh, I'm not letting this beat me. It took me a long time, forever, to, because the people who I grew up with and the family that I grew up around, it was always somebody else's fault, the reason why I couldn't do something. So oh, I never yeah, had any grit in, in my character. Never, ever, ever had any grit. But over and over and over, I've learned to install grit in myself. And it was always very negative, super negative, but really it was because I hated myself, because I did a lot of bad things. But now I've learned to love, truly love myself over and over and over and, and have legitimate gratitude over and over and over and have neuroplastic breakthroughs over and over and over that actually makes me love myself and think good positive thoughts. And I used to talk bad things about people who weren't there or I would say things around people's back and really talk some bad things about people. Really, it was just because I hated myself. Now, all I do is positivity, positivity, positivity. If I say something about somebody behind their back, I really know that it's a huge red alarm in my head now. Whereas back in the day, I wouldn't even think twice about it. But now I hate it because I realize how bad that is for me. If I need to say something to somebody, I'm going to say something to them, not behind their back. And that has helped me a lot. i uh, really grown in confidence. My confidence level is like way up here because I know I'm super capable. No matter what happens, I'll be a, I'll be a capable to fight or continue on and survive because of everything I've been through uh, in the wars and Huntington's and the way I grew up. I got this. Nothing's going to take me out but me, honestly. If I get COVID or if I get, uh, what's it? Oh, shingles. If I get shingles or I get COVID, when I get COVID and I do, it's all be because of me because I eat poorly and I don't work out. I get COVID or I get shingles. So that's because of me, not because of somebody else, only me. I'm responsible for me now. And having that mentality now and kind of finally being an adult as a 40 year old is really sweet because I just love life and the positivity of loving life truly. I just kind of emanate that through the world and try to help other people see life is positive and life is beautiful, even though it's dark and it sucks. But when you get through the night, you see the sun rise and you're like, oh man, there it is. Hell yeah. We made it another day. Sweet. All right, we'll make it another day again. We'll do it again tomorrow. Same thing. So I just had to stay present and very calm and positive over everything. Make jokes out of everything. Laugh at myself, yeah, laugh yeah, at everybody. That's a, that's a big thing about me. It's, it's, it's a way I hide a lot of my passive anger. <laughs> I'll, I'll laugh. I'll just turn everything into a joke. And it's, yeah, I just yeah. Make, make jokes and everything. <laughs> I love myself a ton. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I make a lot of jokes and stuff. A lot of dark, dark humor. Yeah. It's good. It's hilarious for us. So, so a lot of Quentin Tarantino oh, movies. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> definitely. Oh, yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah, it's fun. Well, Brandon, um, is there any links, anybody you want to cool. shout out? Can, I, I, can I tell you. my story in 2006 real quick? Please, go, uh, give go, me as minutes. much time as you want, please. All right, so 2006, cause it, because this is the one. This is like the one that really changed me. Uh, 2006, we bought a house. I'm in 7th Special Forces Group. And they, we find out we're going to Afghanistan. I've been there before, so they want me to go. My team of Intel and Nerds wants me to go with them because I've been deployed a lot before. So I go. And then uh, we're doing our thing, looking around for bad guys, looking to help people who need help, looking for locals to give them rice or medical gear or whatever, training the Afghan soldiers. And we're gathering more and more intelligence and bad guys are getting more and more like, oh boy, this is starting to be really crazy, right? Get bad guys are starting to we're hearing more and more intelligence that there are more and more bad guys and they're better trained and they're better funded oh man and they've got a lot of uh so you guys are scared going in there right not not bit. scared 
Uh, not really. Once you get shot at, it's terrifying. But then you, you realize, okay, I got, I got to do something about this. So then you get over the fear. You don't get over it, but you get you just sit on the back burner. Yeah. Uh, so it, it becomes bother, it real bother. existential, right? Yes. Like yeah. You, you don't you don't let it now. bother you yeah. because it's it's always there, obviously, but you just don't let it bother you because you're pretty highly trained. And well, I wasn't because I wasn't a Green Beret, but the Green Berets have a tiny fear, but they're not that fearful because they're hyper trained on everything. So essentially, they're not too afraid, but still. Every human being is afraid, kind yeah, of so. when, but not not really. That they didn't never showed any fear. Honestly, they pretty much just had smiles on their faces, laughed at everything while fighting. It was awesome to fight with them. Absolutely beautiful to fight with Green Berets. Uh, I'll push and those Kaika. are like the top most. Oh yes, the bad. Like they're bad the Bruce dudes. Lee of the army, right? Like Definitely. they're just bad. Yeah. Yeah, but see, the thing about them is they're like college educated, full uh, uh, not philanthropists, whatever. Oh, philosophers will say that they're f okay. like college-educated philosophers who could also kill you with their fingers or blow you up. And what they're gonna do is start at the smallest level and say, "Come on, come on, come with me. Let's do this." And then if that doesn't work, then they're gonna punch you in the gut and say, "Come on, follow me." If that doesn't work, then they're gonna shoot you or whatever. So they're not—they're really educated and they always try to help build up. They're not trying to kill people. We're always trying to build people up and not just shoot them down. So that's their job is to build people and build nations and build uh, other armies and stuff. So that's what we did. We had Afghan soldiers and we had this mission called Operation Kaika, which means Operation Tick, uh, the little blood sucking insect, which is also pretty funny because it's an acronym in the military. T I C means troops in contact. Uh, so if you get into a tick, it means the bad guy shot at you and you got troops in contact. So. We uh, we get ready to go on this mission, and we realize the bad guys are definitely going to be all over. So we start gathering more intelligence on exactly where we are, and the, yeah, there are bad guys everywhere. The good guys are being kicked out of their houses. We send some of our interpreters to go look at the bad guy area and to find a route in the best route for our guys to get in. They got killed. Uh, three of, out of four of our interpreters were murdered by the Taliban checkpoint. Oh, man. So they knew we were coming, so we had to go early. So we had to go. Like As soon as we found out what happened, we had to go because they knew we were coming. So we had to maintain that element of surprise. And we got there, and yeah, it was the uh, first 12 hours, nothing bad happened because they thought we were going to leave and they were going to attack us when we left. But then they realized we were there for, we were there for five days, but they didn't know that. So they knew, they found out we were staying, so then, then they started attacking us. And it turned out to be f three days of fighting back and forth against a couple hundred guys. And we had 80 Afghan soldiers and 12 of us, like 10 Green Berets, I think, uh, and four or five not Green Berets, regular, and then a uh, special uh, Air Force guy whose job it is to call in air support and drop bombs to the bad guys and a, a military police dog and a military police officer and the dog is to sniff bombs and attack so uh about tw 20 maybe americans uh, and uh, after day two the our afghan soldiers quit fighting so uh because they were just tired of fighting because it was really bad fighting but so you had like a fifth of what they had oh and yeah. you guys still we killed 120 of them they killed two of us but it but every, all of our guys thought we were dead. It was so, it was like Vietnam. And it, this is a documented Vietnam, thing, right? Because oh, yeah, I remember you documented. posting this on Facebook. This yeah, is it's like very a documented. Real... Yeah, it's very documented. And there's going to be movies and books about it. No kidding. Yes, yeah, sir. And you were part of that. Yeah, it was insane. We All, all of us should have died. We were so lucky not to die. What was this um, called again? What Operation is Kaika. K-A-I-K-A. K-A-I-K-A. June 20, 22nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th, 06. And all of us thought we were going to die. Every single one of us thought we were going to die. But we, fought. we continued fighting until... Because we weren't going to give up. But every single one of us thought we would die for sure. But definitely not going to give up. But I wrote a note home to Jessica saying goodbye. And then I could continue fighting after that. Oh my god. Yeah, during a, a, a lull in, in fighting.
And it seems so kind of, love you. I yeah, hope you sorry, because normally I promised I'd always come home, but <laughs> this was not good. This was a bad one. It was essentially it was like a Vietnam era fight where the bad guys overran our base and they were in our patrol base, and uh, we had to fight them off, like you to me, and they wouldn't stop over and over. We bombed them, we shot them up. They did not care one bit. They had really good tactics and really good morale. Don't know how or why, but it was like fighting infantry versus infantry guys. It was like fighting our own own people, kind of. Instead of like a red keg militia that you would think, no, these guys were legit soldiers. And uh, it was epic. The information that my team was giving the commanders, oh man, it was pretty sweet. Uh, slash horrifying because it was really bad information. The bad guys are coming from this way and they're gonna reinforce and they're gonna attack with everything. And so we're giving the Green Beret commander all this information, which was overwhelming, but they took it in stride it because it was beautiful information for him to have. And then we could counterattack and do X, Y, and Z. But it was insane. And days later, we finally, we had to leave. We had to uh, retreat because we had to leave because they were about to kill us all. So we bombed them out. We bombed them with some planes and we used the AC-130, which is a gunship that floats around over here and has cameras and it can see all the bad guys and can shoot at them and blow them up. That was awesome. <laughs> so it it's, so it's, it's missiles or they're bullets? It has both. It has huge missiles, it has bullets, it has bombs, it has artillery up here <laughs> circling around. So it's like Johnny Cash ring yeah. of fire. It's, like it's a yeah, legit man. ring of fire, huh? Yeah, dude. It's, but the cameras are so accurate. It's like, wow. It and shoot. it was in 06. Man, it's oh. what we got now. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was insane. Yeah. Wow. But without that, we'd definitely be dead. Without that air support, definitely would be dead. But the bad guys knew that too. At the beginning of this operation, there were ten other ticks in our unit. Whole, all of Afghanistan was on fire at the same time. The bad guys knew that, so we didn't get air support for a while because all the other uh, our guys were getting air, air support. So it took, it took us like a couple of good hours to get some good air support because the Taliban were attacking everywhere. At the same time. And it's summer of 06, so my mentality, I'm 23, 24 years old, just being a punk at a nightclub, like <laughs> counting down, you know, 90 days of the first Bears game, and you're sitting in there, you know, writing your wife saying, uh, honey, this is my last John Deere. I, um, I just put a flag on the coffin type deal, right? Like, yeah. it's so, oh, man. Like, how do you, man, that's it, so it, intense. I'm be honest, it killed me. Meta, uh, not not literally, obviously, but no, nah, it definitely killed me. Though. How many days? My, my, how, just killed my spirit. The timeline went the the front from the first beginning of the of, of the, the the battle to the end. How long was that? It was only three days. It was supposed to be five. We left early, so three days of fighting back and forth. And Hour, so, for hours of every day fighting back. And, and the forth. Taliban has how many? They had hundreds of guys, and we Hun had twenty. You had 20 special ops, and they had hundreds of guys yes, coming sir. at you. Yeah. So this is literally biblical David and Goliath. Yes, I mean, this is as yeah. David and Goliath as it gets. Yes, sir. Wow. Now, knowing more than, and actually talking to some of the guys, I realized our guys had a little bit more control over the fight. But still, it was really, it was really fucked up. Really fucked up. It was, <laughs> it was really fucked so up. So there's no reason why you guys should have won that? No, not at all. Not at all. Do you still Locked. talk to those gentlemen that oh, are, are alive today? Uh, yes, sir. All the time. I try to talk to them a lot. Cause, because I thought I was suffering really badly just because I'm a giant wimp. No, they're all suffering just as much as me. Even the Green Berets. It was that epic of a fight. Every single one of those guys. Is so really three suffering. days, you're not sleeping. Are you at least getting a nap on a tree once in a while? I was while? pretty good at sleeping. <laughs> yeah? I'll be honest. Yeah, I have a buddy to go pull guards so I take a nap. Yeah, so I was pretty good at taking a nap. If, if I could. Which was weird though, because where I was assuming the entire time that they would creep up on us and throw a grenade in our lap because uh, it was surrounded by grape grape fields, and they would definitely use the grape fields to cover and throw a grenade at us, and I thought they would kill us with a grenade, but thankfully they didn't. Are you so? Are you on? Are you? Are you, are you, uh, are you in a hill? Are you in a valley? Are uh, you? We're in the suburbs of Kandahar, and it was pretty flat. Uh, it's kind of hot, tough to describe because it was a really weird location. 
that we were. It was, it was flat, and uh, there were a couple buildings near us, like a little school, and a mosque, and a little house, and grape drying hut. Grape drying huts are uh, <coughs> grape drying huts are really thick buildings with holes in them, so they're perfect yeah. for them to shoot out. Uh, they're really good fighting positions for the Taliban to shoot at us. We can't hit them because they're inside these really thick mud walls, but they've got little holes. So that would shoot us from those guys a lot. It would take multiple bombs for us to blow those up. Wow. And we didn't realize that at the time, but they had tunnels dug from each grape drying hut. Like the Viet Cong in Vietnam. Yeah. Nuts. Well, and historically speaking, you know, uh, Afghanistan is where military, it's the military graveyard. Like, mili <laughs> like, yes, mi like operations sure. go there to die. They don't <laughs> come out true. of Afghanistan. No worries. Afghanistan was awesome slash horrific because I died. I died there metaphorically or like not physically. I was actually literally dead, but in my, in my head and in my heart, I was dead for sure. So I had to rebuild myself again and again, learn to be a new person. And that took a while, but and then 2007, same same type of thing. Actually, really bad combat, but it did not compare to 2006. No joke, it was insane. But compared to 2006, it was kind of laugh laughable. I'll be honest. And it was insane in 07. But once again, the air support, oh, man, the AC-130 circling overhead, <sighs> messing people up, killing all of these bad guys and my guys. My team would call the Air Force guy and tell them where the bad guys are because of our gear. We're listening to what they're doing and it's pointing to where they are. They're over there, so I call the Air Force guy. And he calls in the bomb run or calls in the AC-130 to shoot a specific guy. And yeah, we, that's awesome. It was fun, <laughs> back and forth, and then... So it's like the like Medal of Honor, but... Yeah, like I, the video I, game, yes. but you're really doing this. Like yeah. You're really calling the helicopter and then boom, 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 yeah, right? Yeah, like, awesome. Yes. <laughs> yes. Call it Call of Duty. Yes. It's kind of. I, I guess I, I haven't played that long. I couldn't even imagine. Me neither, honestly. <laughs> but it was still pretty fun. Slash, I was still pretty silly over there. I still didn't like, take myself seriously. Well, so your your humble opinion, like you're you're like you know you're you, you kind of self put yourself down. But growing up. No one is surprised that you're you're fighting Huntington's disease. I mean, I don't talk to a lot of people, but I'm, if I grab someone that knew you is back it? in the day, no one's surprised that Brandon Pache is fighting Huntington's disease, went through this massive war, you know, and doing all these great things, even though he's had <laughs> all these negative things. Because you were always a military nut and always had some Bruce Lee stuff going on. So it's like, <laughs> the, like when, yeah, so when, right. when, when Neil <laughs> came down and built that stage at Chicago yeah. Hope Cafe, and he's told me, you know, my brother was in this massive, like one of the most famous battles of all time. I'm like, oh wow, that's cool. I'm like, I nothing surprises me about that at all. You know, Jimmy going to jail, Neil getting in a little trouble, Brandon in one of the biggest battles in our country's history. Like, yeah. <laughs> so it's yeah. just like these little things okay. in life. How you are idea. as a kid and your upbringing set you up for. It's 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 weird for me to reconcile that. I don't even know how to like describe that. But something in you as that that kid prepared you for that. Definitely. You know. Thank you very much for that. I appreciate it, man. Whether you're like we're throwing rocks at trains or you're kicking the heck out of the <laughs> Beach Oak Park. Like, oh yeah. And there was a lot got, of it, you know. Got like, caught by the police. Got arrested a few times. Oh man. Got definitely got arrested a few times with you guys throwing rocks at trains and cars and bombed. Uh, All sorts of silly yeah. shenanigans that silly teenagers who don't have any uh, oversight go through. Well, I realize it's because I never heard the word no. Yeah. We never probably, yeah. It was always yes, 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 yes. Whatever they could do. Or a fist, right? <laughs> well, and, and, and I remember as a kid, and, 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 and it real puts, really puts things in perspective now, I remember as a kid, my grandfather talking, and I'd be in the basement, and I'd hear him yell, and he would like, you know what? This kid does not hang out with anybody that has a solid family. Mm -hmm every friend he has has yeah. a broken family and that's true that's like right. none of our friends growing up had no, and no wonder why we're on drugs <laughs> we're in jail we're in gangs i mean no. i mean all the stuff you know i went through and blah 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 yes, and we overcame a lot of that but yeah. man it took a couple of decades thanks god you know i didn't yeah. know i was going to be like 30 when i figured right. all this out right? yeah that's what i think i'm 40 too. still trying to figure it a out late right? bloomers but 
It's the most beautiful bloom, honestly. It is, it is, it is. And that's why, like, you know, you hear these stories about the Great Generation, the Depression, all these people that went through all those yeah. hard times, like... Made them strong people. Yes, yes. That's what I've become because of all the things I've realized that, whoa, I'm a really strong person now. I didn't realize that because of the way I grew up. Made me really weak. Made me really self-conscious over everything that I did or didn't do, but now I just don't care you, about But you you always had this like righteous indignation yes, about <laughs> like always sticking up for like the little guy. Yeah. I, I, you know, no matter how many people were like, oh, this guy's a gangbanger, he's got knives and guns and you'd beat the hell out of him. <laughs> you know, like, dude, I just got out of a master judo class, let's go. And then like, you you know, it'd be on. <laughs> I remember them days. Oh, you know? yeah, that's true. Yeah, if somebody needs help, yeah, why not? But if... Yeah, so it's it's, like it's, it. it's it's not a surprise that you're over in Afghanistan helping people, no. you know, caskets blowing up and stuff like that. It's, just, no, no. it's not a surprise at all. I'm not shocked. <laughs> and um, is there anything you want to throw out there? Any more oh, that's it. stuff you want to uh, add in here? 2006, seven Afghanistan again. 2008 went to South America to, to do the war on war on drugs. Oh God, are you serious? Uh, oh, you were part of that too. Oh yeah. yes, sir. It was it was awesome. However, so arresting you, minorities for having you, dime yeah. bags of cannabis on them and throwing them yeah. in jail for the rest of their for lives. Exactly for coke and stuff. <laughs> it was it was a huge it was a huge grift again. A huge huge money goes over there to fight the war on drugs, but yeah. it just goes to a few people, just like everything else, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh -huh. But it was cool. Kind of silly. Uh, then oh, 2009, actually, I was going to get out of the army, but then I was signing out to leave the army, and I realized my handwriting was really, really bad. And I said, like, "Wow, what's up with this handwriting? Oh, it's got to be Huntington's. Oh shit!" So I decided to re-enlist in the army again and got back in. Went back overseas, at this time as a team leader in charge of two other people, well, three other people. And that was the most beautiful slash horrible thing I could ever do. I loved it so much being, not because I want to be in charge of other people, because I don't really like that, but just to have that accountability and the self-accountability that I needed big time. I really did not need to be in charge of other people because it helped me to be more accountable to myself, even though I let myself down a lot in those. But oh, I think I was actually a very good leader overseas and in combat and training guys to go to combat. I think it was actually very good. My mantra was, my leadership mantra uh, back in the day and now is, I don't know everything, I know a lot, but it all stops with me, but we're always gonna use all of our brains, not just my brain, because I can't think of everything. So if you have other ideas, please hook me up with your ideas because I won't shoot them down. However, the veto does, it starts and ends with me with that. But I will always accept your ideas. Wow. And not, not a, lot, a lot of people do that. You know, it, it's really, you know, growing up, you, you think of like your Patriot or your soldier or your Marine. You know, someone that goes into combat as like this super patriotic, rah, 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 America, Constitution. <laughs> but when they come back, they are some of the most humble and open-minded um, and bipartisan people. <laughs> yes, sir. Like, they're not so stuck in these tribes because <laughs> they yeah. see what tribalism is. They see yes. what these bureaucracies are. They see what, okay, you call a person this and you call a person that. And really, we're all just trying to, like, feed our families here. But, That's it. oh, I'm a Republican, I'm a Democrat. What does that really mean, right? Yeah. It really doesn't mean anything at nope. all, right? It's, it's just, just semantics, it's just, just words, just, just BS. Game. Yeah. If you're not actually doing things, making experiences, that's it. Exper living life, not st stuck in my bubble. I would definitely be stuck in a bubble. I was a really angry libertarian for a while. Really angry libertarian. That's oh where I'm at right now. Pro yeah, that, that's, really that's my party. <laughs> Li angry yeah. libertarian. That's who then I am right now. I kind of came back. And now my, my, my own little party, which is zero party. Yeah. I, I don't have any party. No partisan at all. I'm just right in the middle of everything. Because I don't know if I'm ever going to leave libertarian. My, my, yeah, because my mind constantly changes on things with new information. So why not change with it? But I do, yeah, I don't like to be puppeted from the top at all, and I can feel that. And I don't need somebody to tell me what to do. I know how to wipe my own butt. I can 
Definitely fl flush my own toilet. I don't need anybody to show me how to flush the toilet. Uh, yeah. And yeah, being a leader in combat was the, like the most awesome thing in the world to me. I messed it up a ton, but I definitely did a lot of So were you too. out there like a quarterback almost? Uh, actually, yeah, actually that's a good idea. Good, yeah. really good uh, analogy. Yeah, like uh, Justin Fields now. Oh. Or Mitch Trubisky, Trubansky. I, with a better offensive line. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's because, true. <laughs> and, yeah. and a better owner. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, that would be a really good uh, metaphor for what I was doing over there. Kind of making sure that they knew what was going on. Our guys, my team, and the Green Berets. Because you're blitzing, you're flanking, you're, yeah. you know, all and those. And I always had to make sure that they understood what was going on because they were new. This is their first tour. But we did some really cool things and got in a lot of gunfights. It was sweet. Wow. We definitely took it to them. It was sweet. And uh, the funny thing with my job in the 82nd and in 7th group is we were always gone doing missions with people. In the 82nd, in Afghanistan, we would rotate. So the infantry battalions would rotate, and when we would back, we were always forward. Always, always, always forward. Same thing in 7th group. We were always forward doing more and more missions, and when we were back, we were doing collecting missions from wherever we were located. So we were always really busy. But still find a lot of downtime too to work out and hang out and yeah. do college and stuff. I got a couple of degrees out of uh, hanging out from Uncle Sam, so that was fun. What degrees did you end Spanish? up in? Spanish. I got a couple degrees in Spanish. Got a a couple and, degrees in Spanish? And then one in uh, writing. Oh, and an associate's degree is in writing. Wow. Uh, te technical writing. Interesting. Interesting, man. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. Always learning a little bit here and a little bit there. So, in closing, what do you have to say to someone that's going through Huntington's or PTSD? I always want to close with hope with this podcast. Definitely. Someone that's in the deepest, darkest place in the world. You've seen it. Mm. You, you've, put your, you've put your feet there. Yes, sir. What do you say to that person right now? That's I in, say that's, <clears throat> that's, that's, that's in, that's in. They're not alone. And I'm sorry that you're feeling that way. And it's terrible to have those feelings, but it is normal. Very normal to feel that way after having all these experiences. The darkness actually gets better once you look at it and you're a little more truthful and then you get some mental health. Mental health counseling is number one. Yeah, it really Number is. one, no matter what. No matter what you got to do. And then developing that support system, too, for when you're feeling bad, when you're off. Trying to dump in there and figuring out your plans with like-minded people or your uh, friends and family, what they can do, what they cannot do. Just really figuring out the better things to make you better or worse. And constantly be a scientist for yourself, mentally and physically. And never give up because we're all survivors and we're all warriors. This world, this life here is insane. We have no mo no idea what's really going on. And it's very difficult. But we're here. I'm alive. James is alive. We're survivors. We're warriors. And we're all so much more alike than anyone would like to think. And when we put our... When we put ourselves forward and we put ourselves above uh, the people who want to control us, we're super powerful, insanely powerful. We're godlike. Seriously, seriously, we are all. And we're only super using what five percent of our brain? Not even. <laughs> yeah. Like, <laughs> Can you imagine if we get into like seven yeah. <laughs> percent? Yeah, exactly. Just keep keep fighting, and no matter what, keep fighting because I'm in your corner. Because I love you, 